We'll wait for two minutes to let everyone join and then we'll begin. Hello, Alex. Thank you for joining. Okay, in the meanwhile, uh, we'll wait for some time to let everyone join. And hello everyone, thank you so much for joining. Uh, welcome to another episode of Real World Alpha Chats. I am Gini, your host uh, for today. We'll wait for two minutes to let everyone join. And in the meanwhile, I'll take you all through the flow of today's episode. Uh, as we all know, eMoney Network is world's first MICA compliant RWA blockchain and we've launched this series to discuss RWA and its growth. In today's episode, we will be discussing blockchain brilliance, leveraging smart contracts for RWA tokenization. Uh, we have, uh, we'll have Parag, our MD, MD of eMoney Network joining us soon. We have Alex Sender from uh, Pendulum already here and we have Sergio from Music Protocol. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'll quickly check with Parag, where is he? And then we'll begin. Okay, he is joining us in a minute. In the meanwhile, let's start with introductions from our speakers. So Alex, uh, it would be great if you could introduce yourself and uh, tell us, uh, our listeners a little bit about Pendulum. Alex, can you hear us? I'm not sure if you're talking. Okay. Uh, I think there's some technical issue. So, uh, Sergio, if uh, you could, you know, introduce yourself and tell our listeners a little bit about music protocol. Yes, of course. Can you hear me well? Alex? Yes, uh I can. You want to go first? Uh, I don't know if now your voice is coming through. Okay, I'll go first. 
So you can hear me well. So hello everyone. Thanks for the invitation. My name is Sergio. I, a little bit about, about myself, uh, got into blockchain and crypto, I think back around 2013 during my executive PhD. Got very interested about, if you want the tools, and I think it fits the conversation today. So blockchain is a technology to, in, to basically enable new and diverse uh, economic relationship. So at the time I was studying, because researching and writing about ecosystem dynamics, uh, and if you want new ways to build platform to incentivize ecosystem, that's what it got me very interested into the tech. I started to do my initial investments, Bitcoin, get close to the ecosystem. Uh, between 2016 and 2020, I've been a regulator. I had the pleasure to serve uh, the Republic of San Marino, and I worked to push out what it became, the third legislation in the world on digital assets. So I've done a lot of institutional work in trying to figure out uh, how digital assets can be positioned, if you want, in, in, in existing legislative and economic frameworks. And then in 2020, I founded the Genesis project, which is public pressure. And then I started working on the music industry. Today, I'm uh, the president and CEO of the Web Free Music Association, which is uh, the founder and contributor to Music Protocol. Coming to Music Protocol, what we do is something relatively simple in words, a lot more complex in in, uh, in execution. Uh, what we do is tokenizing economic rights uh, in the music industry. So currently we, we just launched uh, uh, a concept of a product, which is Music Bond, uh, which is backed by economic rights out of streaming. Uh, so we are fully playing into the real world asset tokenization. The roadmap uh, is a lot larger. We've got a few case study on AI, but I'm going to stick uh, with, uh, if you want, the more financial value proposition today being the topic of the space. Thank you so much, Sergio. Over to you, Alex. Can you try to speak now? Yes. Um, Perfect. I switched right. devices. Can you hear me now? Yes, well, loud and clear. Thank you so much. Okay. So then nothing of what I have said already uh, was going through, I guess. So I'm very excited to be here. Uh, sorry about the technical problems. Uh, I'm Alex uh, in the blockchain space since uh, 2013, actually, uh, with Satoshi Pay co-founding that uh, um, at 2014. And I'm also co-founder of Pendulum and the most recent project Vortex that's built on top of that uh, with stable coins. Always my major focus was to solve real world problems with blockchain technology. So not so much caring about the internal crypto uh, problems to solve, but about external uh, problems and external target audiences and uh, and people's problems and businesses problems uh, to solve. That's very exciting. That's I think also uh, that has developed quite fast uh, also in the last months that we've seen and in the last years. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to expl explain and discuss also more about that in this space. Very much looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, over to you, Varag, if you could introduce yeah. yourself. Yeah, Yeah, thank you again. Uh, hi, my name is Varag. I am MD of Web3, the T-Money Network. And uh, I have been in the blockchain space from uh, 2017 and have seen, uh, I think, we have been building uh, infrastructures over blockchain since then, uh, when, uh, some of the chains and protocols. Uh, and, you know, when uh, uh, when we started sort of hearing about the RWA, then that all, you know, we, we figured out that this is going to be like the missing piece of uh, connecting Web2 with the Web3 communities. So that's where, you know, I personally moved to e-money when got to know and, you know, was talking to Raja as well. Yeah, that's about me. Excited to be here. Thank you, Bara. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's get started with our questions. So the first question is for Alex. Um, how do you think blockchain technology facilitates the tokenization of RWA and fiat currencies? Um, yeah, I can speak i mean for stable coins and fiat currencies mainly as also real world assets so um how blockchain facilitates um the tokenization of those fiat, of those fiat currencies is um uh, is very is a very interesting topic and actually to understand that 
you uh, have to understand a little bit about fiat currencies also, because that was uh, when I, let's say, read somewhere the, the Bitcoin paper and when I got into the crypto space and then I learned, OK, you can just send around money from device to device and, and that's trusted and that works somehow and I can buy things with that. And then I asked myself, okay, how is that actually working in the traditional space with banks? And um, what blockchain technology uh, facilitates the most is creating a standard for money, actually, if you would say you have a US dollar stable coin or you have a euro stable coin or some other currency stable coins, then this can be, let's say, exchanged between uh, parties also internationally without any uh like limits right so as everyone would say okay that's probably the standard how things work also in the traditional finance uh, system that's unfortunately not the case because uh money in a traditional finance space is, is just an entry in in a database uh where um let's say the administrator of the bank has access where there are more people having access and then the bank itself uh, differs from bank to bank internationally, so there are different regulations for banks. So if one bank wants to do business with another bank and they say, I have $100,000, um, th then the other bank first needs to check that, make contracts, do some due diligence, what this bank status is and so on, to be able to trust that word, right? And uh, blockchain technology, uh, what's the biggest breakthrough is actually that uh, if someone says, I have USDT, USDC, I have a Euro C, I have some uh, coins, then you can, I mean, you can check that uh, uh, if uh, the balance is there and right. And if you trust that stable coin, of course, so the stable coin issuer comes into place, uh, then you know, okay, the, the money is there and you know exactly what it's worth and you know how it's being sent and how it's being settled. And uh, I think that's the major uh, facilitation that you have like an international standard, right, of money that you can also aggregate. You can aggregate that liquidity globally, uh, right? That's not so easy if you want to aggregate liquidity between, let's say, 10 banks in the traditional system. And uh, and for users and consumers, uh, it's, uh, it's actually even better because these... Um, fiat-backed stable coins that we mainly speak uh, speak of when we talk about these stable coins. So we talk about stable coins like Circle, uh, US dollar, or um, yeah, the, their Euro token, or uh, also Tethers, US dollar, which are yeah fully collateralized, right? So they are backed by uh, US bonds or even uh, the fiat money. That's actually a, a, a type of money of the highest qualities because that's actually cash, that's digital cash. Uh, whereas if you have money in your bank account, that doesn't necessarily mean that the bank has that money in cash, right? Because uh, uh, money, as we know, is a thing that you need to trust. And, uh, and, and all these banks, they don't have to actually, let's say, fully collateralize uh, all the money uh, and all the entries in their databases uh, uh, with the bank. That's why it's actually a higher a higher risk uh, than having stable coins in your blockchain wallet. Um, so yeah, these are very interesting, let's say, mechanics. The major thing I think is the standardization that comes uh, uh, with the stable coin, with token standards in the blockchain space, and of course the settlement technology and that there is no admin having uh, uh, super user rights right on uh, on your uh, balance uh, in, in your bank account right so that's uh, decentralized technology I think um, are the big uh, facilitators and, and the big advantages of uh, tokenization of fiat currencies uh, with blockchain I totally agree. Thank you so much, Alex. It uh, yeah. it was great to know so much about uh, stable coins. Okay, so with uh, stable coins, you know, there's always a question about the regulators and how the developers collaborate. So the next question to you, Sergio, how do you think can the regulators and the developers collaborate to create, you know, a conducive environment for stable coins as well as for RWA tokenization? Very good question. Like, I would say the regulators are already somehow contribute 
because if you look at Europe, uh, I think the Mikar is coming to into the picture. It's going to come into full execution, I think, from January to 25. Uh, and stable coin is one of the most interesting categories uh, which have been clearly somehow regulated. All right. the, the question of what I wonder like recently to open maybe the conversation to something a little bit more provocative uh, is I like, what stable coin are gonna be allowed to do? I like, for example we mentioned USDT. Like when we when we were designing our RWA offering, this is like something that with the team we debated a lot. Right? What is the the advantage today to run a stable coin? That effectively to be on every exchange, uh, to be classified as an utility token uh, and be widely available in the market, uh, you cannot distribute uh, any yield. But what effectively a stable coin today is doing uh, is cashing one to one US dollars. Uh, and then uh, mostly, in most of the cases, these reserves, uh, they basically go back in uh, U.S. Treasury bills on investment. They're basically invested in the market. Uh, and all that reward uh, stays within the stablecoin. It doesn't go back to the token holders. So what I've been wondering recently is what is going to be, if you want, the regulatory approach uh, in managing uh, this part of the cash, uh, which is now entering back the market. And this is somehow our biggest value proposition for whatever we're building in terms of tokenized assets, right? And that's where I translate uh, the opportunity of Larry Finch and BlackRock, uh, which are arguing that every financial instrument, uh, it's going to be tokenized. So one angle is, uh, is good that it's tokenized because you have technological benefits, which are going to decrease compliance cost, uh, settlement cost. Uh, so you have a technical if you want consideration in this part of the decision making, is a lot better to run a financial market on blockchain than run it on, if you want, different isolated database and web to legacies. No? If you apply the same principle across banking, I mean, it's a lot better to have all the financial instrument clearly registered and transacted on the blockchain to make sure that you have proof of ownership, you decrease the cost of uh, transaction of value fees, due diligence, uh, and and whatever is all the other items that falls into into this sort of arguments. But then the other point is uh, like that we still have a lot of money bumping into crypto. So you've got times, uh, if you do a financial consideration, you have times uh, where it's actually better to be, let's say, invested in crypto projects uh, because you look at the capital gain, you look at the growth of the market. But there are times uh, where, I don't know, the money move uh, into stable assets. And something that we truly believe is uh, that in the next cycle, during the next cycle, a lot of those money, they're going to maybe move into real world assets rather than stables because they're going to be regulated financial instrument uh, and they're going to be able to provide an yield. They're going to be able to basically become, uh, uh, how do you say, security tokens uh, and be available as an investment for, for, for the crypto market. And today you can't because today what you need to do so basically say you're stable, go back in fiat uh, and then go to your portfolio manager and basically buy shares of any, any, any of the traditional, if you want, Web2 financial instrument. So this for me are like the two most important drivers uh, which I'm really closely looking in to understand what is going to be the policy. Right? Because I think the consideration to the question, you have technical consideration on how you regulate stuff, but you also have business consideration on, on how you want uh, the existing ecosystem uh, and financial market to, to be changed by, by new technology and new stuff. And this is, I think, is the part of the conversation which is very difficult to predict, uh, but most important to build the thesis on. I totally agree. It will become uh, seamless and faster with RW tokenization and with the growing technology. It makes sense. Thank you, Sergio. Okay, when it comes to, uh, you know, the technology, the transactions, there is uh, one thing which is, uh, you know, always uh, in someone's mind, which is about the transparency and the security. So, Parag, the next question is for you. Uh, how can you explain that, uh, you know, like how these smart contracts ensure transparency and security in RWA token transactions or say, you know, a stable coin transaction? 
Yeah, great question. I think the see uh, we know that you know blockchain comes from a you know these core principles, and one of the things why why is the uh, liquidity of an illiquid uh, thing or you know a very slow uh, liquidity moving sort of markets where you are not algorithmically trading things. How why why is that important? Because that moves. Uh, that that enables them to move faster also right because now you are able to liquid you know convert these uh, rwa assets into tokens and you can do all these th- uh, things now like whatever defi protocols which we have seen so those are like inherently coming i think one of the things why this rwa also is uh, like the web2 is also seeing the value of rw in the blockchain is, is because of these two core principles i would say which has enabled the you know uh, development of the whole smart contract infrastructure where every code is also out there right which basically gives a lot of transparency and security for the users okay. yeah. thanks farad uh okay next question to uh, alex uh, what are some emerging trends or innovations in the blockchain technology that could uh, you know impact our w tokenization or even the emergence of stable coins in the industry um yeah very good uh, a question there uh, yeah always innovations happening like the last let's say innovation uh, or or a big trend uh, uh, let's say that that we um uh, let's say um that we saw or that we could use or let's say the biggest change was actually when uniswap sushi swap so the whole defi uh, decentralized finance actually emerged uh, a couple, couple of years ago not so long ago actually uh, so uh, it's uh, because we tried to uh, already enable and link the um uh, the fiat system and to cross border payments over a blockchain beforehand but then we had a lot of let's say intermediaries still for market making so there was a market maker uh, um manually doing market making on uh, a kind of old school um dex right where uh, then the forex exchange the currency exchange would happen for a, um, a cross current uh, like a cross border transfer and also there was not much uh, enough liquidity usually there there were still order book like uh, a kind of uh, dexes life and so we embraced actually that innovation that came from these automated market maker technologies because it solved a lot of the journey and a lot of the intermediaries um yeah could be um uh, just skipped uh, there so we didn't have the market maker problem anymore that was an automated market maker then and uh also the liquidity allocation worked much better with the passive market making these automated market makers are working with so um yeah two two big enablers i think uh and the dex landscape has even innovated uh a little further on that so uh, our own vortex dex that we use for um fiat stable coins currency exchange is now actually an an active one so it's working with an oracle uh, it's an oracle based dex uh that um doesn't need any arbitrageurs to to move the price uh to where it is but it takes just into bank rates as the price and uh, this way works much more efficient for liquidity providers uh, but also for the user who would always uh, have the best rates for let's say if you want to do uh exchange your US dollars to euros or to brazilian real or argentinian uh pesos or any other non usd currency and uh, and that's a big plus because usually this currency exchange currently happens with the the current ramping infrastructure and um the fiat gateway infrastructure usually us dollars are sent to emerging markets and then there is a currency exchange happening in the traditional banking system which is very expensive and very slow uh and moving that uh on chain uh which vortex does uh, actually it, it could be done only with these technological innovations uh, that I was talking about so dex technology definitely moving forward um on the other hand more on the front end i would say we are seeing 
especially this year, I think a breakthrough in user interfaces uh, for blockchain apps, applications, dApps uh, with these passphrases or uh, uh, that, that you could use just your phone and, and uh, authenticate transactions, create wallets uh, just without, let's say, the hassle uh, first being onboarded with a seed phrase and writing this down on a paper and so on. So there is um, yeah, a more evolved, uh, let's say, level of user experience or user interface there, which also authenticate, I think, uh, in a secure way um, that only you have access to your funds. I think uh, we were always waiting for that because that was like since we tried to sell this to mass user audience um, since 2016 or 2017, this had been a major obstacle for all applications we were developing on on uh, yeah on blockchain technology uh, and now this is actually solved in a very nice way the user experience is now actually the same uh, uh, than uh, in a web2 app where you authenticate let's say a web2 payment app where you also authenticate with a second factor or a face id or uh, another um yeah, and, and another factor, right? And that's quite nice. And I think that's also a trend uh, and innovation that came more or less beginning of the year. Uh, I've seen the first apps using that. And now I think it's a common standard also where I think the Coinbase wallet implemented it. So, uh, yeah, that's that's a great thing. And that definitely has an impact also to real-world asset tokenization and stable and, uh, and tokenized fiat because... Uh, this is where the, the the normal user, let's say, or the non-crypto uh, savvy user is able to use these dApps, and they're more interested probably in the real-world asset and the, the tokenizations, um, maybe than the crypto users to, from today. Got it. No, it definitely, you know, streamlines the entire process, uh, especially when it is compared to the uh, traditional methods. Got it. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Now, when we talk about innovation and, uh, you know, new trends coming in in the space, uh, there are certain advancements like there is, uh, you know, interoperability between different blockchains and uh, basically it enhances the scalability of uh, the RWA tokenization platform. So, Sergio, this question is for you. Like, uh, how do you think these advancements, innovations are, uh, you know, enhancing the RWA tokenization or even, uh, you know, for stable coins? Uh, Emily, I think it's all about the liquidity at the end of the days uh, or the user base. I, I think I've been one of the one of the first like multi-chain maximalists uh, back in the last bull uh, where I started really, the, 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 sorry, the, next, the last cycle where I started saying uh, we can't be uh, attached to a single ecosystem. Like if we want to scale the decentralized application, we need to be able to work cross-chain because effectively become uh, a very simple internationalization decision-making. I, I'm, I, Founding the application and finding the product in one ecosystem. That's what I bootstrap. Uh, it's like opening a company in Italy to make an example. That is the country I come from, but you cannot assume uh, that you can move people like to come and buy your product over there. No, at some point you need to decide how to distribute globally, how to get access globally. And until you don't have uh, a perfect uh, interoperability running between ecosystems, uh, that's where I think lots of projects starting to look out to deploy from tokens uh, to application, how to get uh, people in different ecosystems to interact with the smart contracts. And that's where we started somehow looking in all the cross chain uh, uh, like technology that was available in the market. I think today, for example, layer zero is one of the biggest players, but that's in this phase of the blockchain industry, I think is super important because you can assume that you can exhaust, uh, if you want, the demand maybe in a single chain and a single ecosystem. So actually structuring the offering and the product uh, was actually today in a team meeting debating exactly this sort of decision making on how we're going to make sure that the product is as widely available as possible. And then with RWA, it becomes a little bit more complicated, right? Because 
a simple ERC-20 token is a token. So it can be deployed natively, natively like USDC across different ecosystems. When you look at RWA, you might have a lot more compliance to satisfy. Maybe you need to impose KYC. Maybe you need to impose, uh, how do you say, like a limit in terms of holding uh, for each individual wallet or each individual or each, in, or each corporation. So you have a lot of rules which are part of the financial regulation which you're going to need to comply with. And, I mean, wondering how you're going to enforce this stuff across different ecosystems, it's a very hard question yet to answer. I don't think you have, like, technology that could guarantee 100% that if you deploy natively, uh, like, you're going you're gonna to be able to enforce all these rules. Otherwise, maybe local deployment uh, or specific smart contract, basically a full duplication of whatever you're running on a chain. But this is like, I think, the most important technology evolution that we need to see to make sure that real-world assets are going to somehow fly and become widely available. Like, we've been somehow recently trying to design, I've seen example out there, like, you know, on the finance, for example, where you have a like, very ingenious design in a way that you, you can basically like run the compliance, run the KYC, uh, at the time the people access the yield. So effectively, you're changing the flow on when uh, the user is supposed to do something and can basically benefit from the token they just bought. And that one somehow simplify the circulation. So, I mean, we got to study that project because we, we were looking for a solution exactly the same for our music bond because we wanted to make sure that it can circulate on DEXs, it can circulate in, in as many if you want liquidity environment as possible without having, if you want the problem that you cannot enforce the compliance that we are subject to, to, uh, to somehow follow, to, to, to stay in business. So I think it's very important how the cross-chain technology is gonna, it's gonna develop and it's gonna somehow support uh, a lot of an easier development and, and, and infrastructure building environment. I totally agree with the growing, rapidly growing industry and also with such a dynamic industry, it is very important. Thank you, uh, Sergio. So, okay, this is uh, the question of all, uh, for all of you. So you've been a part of, uh, you know, very successful uh, projects. I would like to know what are the key challenges and successes that you have, uh, you know, faced so far or any experience that you would like to share with our audience? Uh. I think I can start with that because I think having a right vision is very, very important. And adding right people who believe in the vision and not just hiring. I think these are the most critical, I would say, because then you ask about the previous experiences. But yes, in blockchain space, it becomes very, very different. Uh, because you need to have like the right set of talents who understand more than one specific specific thing, right? So with engineers, I'm, I'm more coming from the tech skinny because that's what my score is. But uh, when it comes from, you know, hiring or, you know, adding your engineers, uh, you have to also know that they are, they don't just know the coding. They are interested in the DeFi space or they understand, you know, how AMM works or how chain works, that is super hard to find, like the like the best of both the things. I mean, you have to sometimes compromise, but I think these these I these main two things I see. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you, Barag. Alex, would you like to add anything to your sure. experience? Yeah. Yeah. Many stories uh, uh, around there. I'm <laughs> <So>. sure. <laughs> um and uh, I think what was most challenging for us because we, we uh, tried to combine several things and to, um, to, to make a product, to offer a product then um, to a user who might not be super crypto savvy is, uh, is working with partners in the crypto ecosystem. So it's, it's very volatile. And also uh, what, what you learn with partners is you can only, let's say, trust what you can see and test and what's life today, right? You can uh, uh, almost like in, in only in very rare cases, you can trust something that is planned for 
I don't know, next month or uh, the next year or something. I remember uh, we were waiting in, I don't know, in 2017 for a euro token being issued um, on uh, on the Stellar blockchain. And it was always like two weeks until a uh, UK regulator would approve it and so on. So and it, uh, I think it took one or two years after <laughs> always taking two more weeks. Right. So, I mean, this is these are kind of challenges uh, that are, of course, not like let's say, uh, the responsibility necessarily of the partners you're working with, but it's the whole ecosystem uh, we're working in, especially with real-world assets or fiat uh, stablecoins. Uh, the regulatory uh, like uh, field has a big impact on your partners and if a product is possible or not, right? And I think we reached a little more clarity in Europe, at least, uh, with that whole regulation. And uh, I think it helps. And let's say before that, um, in most of the cases, there just is no no regulation, right? There is no guideline. And so you need actually partners who would move in such a unsecure space, right, where things could change tomorrow. And it's really very hard to invest uh, uh, for institutions to invest in such a um, a surrounding in such an area, so I think finding partners in uh, that that are also believing that this moves into a positive way, right? That this can be regulated, that this can be dealt with, and uh, and and they want to be early then um, uh, in that market, uh, securing their position there. I think that's essential. So uh, if you talk partners, uh, there's Definitely a different sensitivity or uh, yeah, a, a different yeah environment out there. I would say uh, I think most of of the challenges we had were also impacted by that. That's interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Alex. <laughs> and I totally agree. I mean, I've seen in this like in this industry, partnerships and collaborations, you know, happen faster and you know everyone is there to support each other and uh, it's it's a uh, great i totally agree uh sergio over to you would you like to share some of your experiences yeah i would add a comment on that one then they happen very fast and they die very fast that's one of the biggest <laughs> problems that you have <laughs> in this industry because everyone is desperate about building relationship but then it's very difficult to somehow steer the boat on the same way because it's so unpredictable what's going to happen in the next week uh, that it's very hard to keep all the agendas aligned or uh, the roadmap aligned uh, so this is one of the hardest challenge uh, to actually to keep up with right you cannot it's not that certain that if you decide uh, to build in one ecosystem you're going to last in that ecosystem with everything uh, or you're going to need uh, to somehow take different decisions move around depending on what's going on so, I mean, I think that at the end of the day, the biggest challenge is, uh, is actually surviving in crypto. Uh, people that know me well, and if you actually are listening to the, to the space, I, I always share GIF when I'm in Telegram, I've always been an avid user of Telegram for the last uh, three, four years. I always share GIFs around Vikings and, and, and gladiators, which is a certain, in a certain way, a sort of idea that that we are living the sort of life. No? We are very technological, but we are exploring. Every founder in Web3, in Web every team in Web3 is exploring an uncharted territory. Uh, you start with an idea, then you have to adjust it, and you discover that the market doesn't understand it, you've got to change it, maybe the money, the technology, uh, what's going on around you. Everything is so dynamic. I think that the biggest challenge is building teams uh, which are willing to fight for a long time because it takes a long time to nail it down. It takes a long time to keep the focus, to be resilient, uh, to keep on building, uh, to keep on adjusting the value proposition, keep on fostering the relationship that you created uh, until you crack it. Uh, and at that stage, maybe life is going to change. It's not even certain because it can change again within a month. But somehow, this is, I think, is the biggest challenge. Right? You can have a great idea, but I think we moved a long way from the 2017, where a great idea was enough to raise 30 million. And what we have seen is a lot of projects that deliver nothing out of those ideas. 
hope 2017 became a bit sort of scam environment. And now I think uh, we live in a different market. The community is very conscious, it knows how to do the due diligence. You have Telegram groups, it's transparent, they ask you questions. Maybe whatever you produce as documentation, uh, I mean, it's difficult to write something uh, uh, for every target. You know, if you know what I mean, if you go back uh, in my corporate days, depending on the profile of the client, uh, you were designing different communication tools, different decks so with different points, depending on what those people were actually uh, looking for. Right? Today, we're basically talking with the whole world, every target pretty much at the same time. So, I mean, this is a very tough exercise for a team to go through. And, I mean, kudos to everyone that has gone through successfully, especially everyone who has survived I, the last bear market, which I think has been has been brutal, uh, because building in those environments is very hard. But as I say, this is the biggest challenge. I think we we're really facing a human sort of challenge more than technical challenge. Right? Technical challenge is high, but I mean the most difficult one to 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 go through is the human and emotional challenge to somehow run projects which are public, uh, which have a community that complain is happy. So you have to deal with a lot of stuff trying to figure out uh, exactly how you are delivering or what you want to build. It's not an easy task. Totally. I totally agree on the part where you said that the bear market has been brutal <laughs> and the community is becoming very aware. Everyone does their research. So, yes. Okay. And now the last question uh, to all the speakers before I open the floor uh, to our listeners to ask any questions. Where do you see, of, you know, the future of RW tokenization? I know it is very unpredictable with all the things that keep on happening. But still, where would you like to see the future of RW tokenization heading, say, maybe in the next five to ten years? This is for all the speakers. Can I take this one first? Can I? Yes, definitely. So my bet is relatively simple. Uh, the biggest opportunity I think is going to happen uh, when generally you have uh, the largest inflows uh, on stablecoin in the market. And what we are betting is uh, that if the, R the RW offering is going to be properly structured, like widely available during that capital flow, we can actually somehow fight uh, for that liquidity in a very competitive way. So sometimes I'm simply like asking the question, if you would trust, let's make an example on our product, music bond, as much as you trust the USDC or USDT, like would you buy into something that doesn't give you an yield or would you buy into something that is going to give you an yield when you park your liquidity? So the answer, I think, is pretty simple. So my bet is that this is one of the biggest opportunity to grab the liquidity and create basically allowing crypto capital to have exposure in the same form of tokens to traditional financial instrument. And that's one part of the game. And, I mean, if the market is going to really grow to expectation, we're moving from two, 2 trillion to what, 10, 12 trillion in terms of market cap. So it's a lot of money that could start uh, helping us to build this transition in, into tokenized assets. But then you also have on the other side the opportunity to prove uh, the financial instrument tokenized or structured on the blockchain are effectively cheaper, easier to maintain, easier to issue, and they are a sort of better financial structure than traditional financial instrument. So again, with music, uh, we argue that it's very hard privately or with traditional instrument to get financed why with uh, tokenized asset, we could actually increase the liquidity, the flow in the industry. So you have a sort of win-win, but that's what, I, what I'm looking, what I'm betting on, and I hope it's going to happen. Fingers crossed on I that. I can just speak. Yes, Varag. Yeah, I can just speak from, you know, my perspective. One is from the space perspective, but just as an individual, as a techie, I mean, I've always believed in the efficiency. One of the reasons I'm not like uh, coming from the RWA space. I am uh, like uh, always has been digital programming my life and all. So I've personally never invested in real estate for rental yields, you know, 
these are the concepts i mean they made sense for me but for me it was like it's so inefficient why should i even participate but when i first started hearing about the narratives here in the rwfas and it just makes sense i mean this is how it should be done you know i i put some money whatever i have or i want to instead of buying the whole asset and i earn the yield i can get out whenever i want and then i can you know someone i can borrow based on that token also i mean it just makes sense it's just an efficient system i don't know why it doesn't exist so yeah that's what i see hopefully every it becomes as efficient and as simple as i'm saying or envisioning at least so that would be great we would make a great impact as you know everyone participating in the ecosystem doing our own thing like we're building game protocols covering an industry i hope you you know future is so much efficient and easy for the alternate investments where digital tech is like me have never touched and can bring some algorithms some more performance etc etc to stabilize the market as well yeah yes uh perfect let me also add to that uh that's okay so uh can can you still hear me or uh am I yes yes okay. yes Alex you Perfect. can please go. all right so um yeah i would say i mean it's different like where, where i want to see the future of uh, rwa and then maybe <laughs> where i see the future of rwa so i i fully agree like we we i i want more like inefficiencies to be resolved uh, there by um tokenization of uh, real world assets uh, i I kind I'm I'm kind of a little more conservative on on the speed maybe but there will be more and more use cases actually be opening up uh, uh for being for tokenization I know teams here in Germany working on uh, tokenizing of securities then finally so there's uh like there's real estate there's there's much more choice coming on chain and that's uh, much more easier than to integrate into user interfaces into um yeah s s standards and wallets and so it will be much more accessible and inclusive i think next 5 to 10 years i also think that um that this track like uh, tokenization the fiat like this uh still like needs some some time to build up so it's it's like constantly building up actually since uh i don't know since ever and then you had these overlaying uh, hypes right around nfts or around around defi initially and so on but actually these stable coins and and also real world asset uh, cases they are just constantly growing so they are actually for me uh there are the actual long story uh, uh around that that's why it can only go up right if you look long term right and and uh, with the industry in general and uh i think that's where i see uh the industry in the next 5 to 10 years so building up and building up also speed i think because uh at one point we will see a, a, a turning point uh once also some more institutions or governments or uh, uh, i don't know some some legal structures are uh, being more compatible with blockchain technology i think once you have um solved the trust uh, at the point of tokenization right and made that efficient uh, i think then uh, yeah there will be a lot more adoption coming much quicker uh, than today so yeah that's my take on it Thank you so much Alex that was very interesting. Okay, and now uh, I will open the floor uh, for our listeners to ask questions. So if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand and I'll uh, give you the access to talk. Any requests? Okay, none so far. I think everyone was very clear about all the questions that were asked uh, in the session today. Okay, so before we end, anything from the speakers? Anyone would like to add anything?
Yeah, I, I had one thought uh, that actually I wanted to share. Uh, it was a question how regulators and developers actually like collaborate maybe uh, and 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 uh, can create an environment for stable okay. and uh, uh, real world assets. So and, and maybe that's an interesting thought to look at the the regulator, uh, like the task of the regulator, because the regulators are protecting the consumer right from certain risks. Uh, traditionally, and they also try that in the blockchain world. What I see now in blockchain technology, because there's like fully decentralization, right? You don't like um, work with entities that, that you then go to sue, sue or something. So we have to work differently as a regulator. And I think the regulator needs to work together with uh, developers that are, for example, uh, what like prevents consumers from risking their money or losing their money, right? It is... Um, an, a well audited smart contract, right? So that, that uh, should be, let's say, um, made as a requirement maybe from the regulator's perspective. So they need to think differently. And I think at this point, um, they need to collaborate because the, um, this task or this responsibility is being taken over by, let's say, security uh, tech and security developers. Uh, they protect the users. Uh, and make sure the smart contract is safe and it does what it should do and there is no no leak, for example. So um, I think that's a very interesting view uh, that this changes completely from, a let's say, a bureaucratic and a legal field to a more tech field where definitely um, collaboration is um, very much required uh, between these two parties. Totally. That was very interesting. Thank you so much, Alex, uh, for the insight. Okay, now that we have no uh, more questions. Yeah, Sergio, would you like to add anything? Yeah, no, I mean, it was an interesting point, the one from Alex. Like, going back to my experience, uh, something I always believed and I tried to implement when I was like on the regulatory side uh, was that effectively, like up to which point... Uh, regulator can really protect uh, because private transactions are not protected. I, you can scam an 80, 80 years old woman by getting all the savings uh, into a private company and if she's going to write a check and take the shares uh, and then you're going to well, go bust and not say run away with the money because that's a, a sort of different legal uh, implication. But if you fail, uh, there's no protection there. Right? So what I always thinking is uh, how far actually the protection is over who is issuing because effectively a lot of financial products which have been pushed to market, uh, I mean, they were not protecting anyone. So I'm not going to get deeper than that. But somehow the principle should be how do we redesign regulation, or at least this is the principle I was applying, how do we redesign regulation based on the fact that we got new tools, right? So I think it's building on top of what Alex had just said. Today I've got technology. Today I've got a technology with a number of properties that can provide uh, an immutable ledger, can execute settlement, can record uh, documentation, can make sure that a lot of stuff... Uh, that before was uh, somehow delegated to trustworthy professionals uh, which are licensed by the regulator to they can be executed by the software. So if this principle is correct, uh, how far I need to improve, uh, change, amend uh, the regulatory framework uh, to make sure that I mean this opportunity to innovate uh, is going to be fully exploited then somehow someone maybe is not going to be fully protected because nothing protects everyone every time. This is like a principle of life. But that should be the, the logical approach because every time something new comes to market, that something is going to change a lot of things in the previous paperwork, which I basically have written as legislation. But then I think like you asked what we would like. The other thoughts it was actually on adoption. I'm, I'm thinking one of the reasons why we like music, you know, which I mean is a sort of controversial topic in, in, in crypto, like that. There's been a lot of music project, but there's no a clear somehow 
narrative of music of where music is gonna go and where free. And this is one of the main reasons why we decided to focus uh, on the initial execution around reward asset, which is a narrative that people understand, is a narrative that people are researching, it's a narrative that people are expecting to grow and are expecting to, to buy into. Right? Is the music as well somehow it's a simple adoption thinking, right? How the revenues, how this financial instrument, how this token is gonna is gonna produce my yield, and how what is the risk that it is not gonna happen, how the revenues are generated. And I always think if I look at streaming rights, I basically just wake up in the morning, I'm gonna start thinking how many people are gonna push play in Apple Music and Spotify, and that's basically my proof that the income stream is safe. And I can maybe research a little bit and I'm going to find tons of reports of Goldman Sachs and the major investment banking, like projecting music industry to grow on a steady 8 to 10% a year in terms of streaming until 2030. And suddenly you have a very simple decision-making framework that is a lot easier to somehow due diligence on than more complex real estate, uh, private credit, and complicated financial instrument, which more likely are going to be more appetible for professional, which are investing regularly in, uh, in financial instrument in Web2. So even thinking when we design product and when we bring stuff to market, adoption is pretty, it's pretty important. I totally agree. And with... Every, like a lot of new things coming, uh, you know, in the industry with all the dynamic changes for adoption. I think education and awareness is also very, very important. Like you mentioned with the risk, due diligence and all of that. Thank you so much, Sergio. Okay. As I see no request, uh, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you to all the speakers, uh, Sergio, Alex, Parag. Uh, thank you for taking the time and thanks to all our listeners to join. If uh, you want any updates from our projects, please follow, uh, you know, eMoney Network, Music Protocol and uh, Pendulum on social media. Also, all our speakers here and uh, we'll see you all soon in the next episode. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thanks, thank everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.